We're the last panel before drinks. You guys still with us? All right. This was absolutely one of the coolest groups of people I ever got to interview in preparation for this. You know, technology is an amazingly powerful tool. We know that it always is a double-edged sword. There's wonderful things it can do for good, just as much as it can be used for some not-so-good things, some nefarious things. What we're going to talk about in this panel with each of the panelists that we have here is the impact of technology and what each of these individuals are doing specifically for tackling issues specifically related to human trafficking. And you're going to hear concrete, real-world examples. God bless the policy papers that get written. These people are building and acting upon data and doing some real-world stuff that I think you're going to be quite impressed with. And Hannah, I want to start with you, because um, what you're doing in tackling Asia in particular, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit, the challenge of working in a multilingual environment. You specifically have done this with your research and with the app that you're doing right now. It'd be great to tell the audience a bit about what you're working on. Cool, thanks. Um, so I'm Hannah, I'm from the United Nations University, and maybe just to give some background, I'm a computer nerd as well. Um, my background is in computer science and um, in particular human-computer interaction. Um, we started working in human trafficking only at the end of last year when um, I got in contact with the Mekong Club after reading an, an article in the South China Morning Post about them to say, um, well, I'm into ICT for development and I was doing a stakeholder analysis of seeing what people are doing. And Matt and Sylvia from the Mekong Club have the experience in human trafficking. And they had the idea of using technology to look at bridging the communication divide as well as the um, understanding of what human trafficking looks like. So I'm a computer scientist and a researcher, so we went back to the basics to say what are um, frontline responders and NGOs and people like that currently doing to identify victims. We know from the figures that there's not very many um, people who are identified. So how can we help in this space? So we went and did some research with NGOs, with government and human trafficking survivors to say how are people identifying victims and how could they use technology to do their job better. Um, and from this we saw that really there were three big problems. First of all, there was obviously migrant workers are migrants, they speak different languages. So they, the frontline responders couldn't communicate with the people who they found. There was also a different understanding of what human trafficking looked like in different sectors. And then thirdly, there was a problem with trust. So trust in the system, trust in the workers, and trust in the translators. So if we could have a way of having questions and indicators of human trafficking in different sectors and have the, um, say the questions or the indicators available in different languages, um, then the NGO worker or the frontline responder goes up to a victim, a potential victim that they find and they think might be in trouble but can't communicate with. And they provide them with their own phone and some headphones so it can, they can have some privacy um, in answering questions. And the person has audio recordings of um, questions like, are you abused? Um, are you able to leave if you want to? Do you want to leave? Do you want help from us now? Um, so we're in the process of refining our lists. We're on to our, next week is our third working group in um, Thailand. And then I'm also doing a bit of programming in the background to make the system, <laughs> um, to work with the Department of Special Investigations in Thailand, the Anti-Human Trafficking Center, there's a lot of acronyms, um, and the UN Act, um, and to see how we can use this to help identify more victims. Thank you. And it's really important, you know, what she's describing here, because what you're going to hear as we kind of go down the line here, this is talking about the front end research work that we have to do. So we've got to go and create some things and test some things, and it's, it's a brilliant approach. Rob, you know, one of the th you have an amazing CEO in, in Mark yeah. Benioff. Yeah, Mar Mark Benioff. Uh, so we work for uh, Salesforce.com. So what, what I do, I'm, I'm an engineer. I, I work with uh, large, large corporates in building and architecting systems for managing customer data. And about a year and a half ago, um, we were approached by Liberty Asia to help them. Um, Duncan had this passionate vision for how to build a victim case management system at scale. 
Now, because we're, we're Salesforce, our CEO, Mark Benioff, has this one, one, one model. Essentially, philanthropy should be integrated into the corporate operating model, what you do every day. And that's embedded in our culture. So we give away, one, the one, one, one means 1% 1 of equity goes to our .org. 1% uh, of employee time, that's millions of hours of volunteer hours that we have. And 1% of our product, we actually develop product and give away product to nonprofits. So in this case, Liberty Asia wanted, had this vision for building this out. And in terms of some of the um, real world problems that you had, there was fragmentation because there are hundreds of NGOs working in the space for human traffic, victim, uh, <coughs> helping victims of human trafficking. And each of them has a different view of what a victim looks like in that case record system. So what we did is we looked at things like um, security and scale. Security because even if they're both NGOs in the same space, they don't trust one another, right? So we needed to sort of firewall each of the organizations. Also adoption, we wanted to make sure that this thing is going to scale. So w what we did is we worked with the team and we essentially assembled a pro bono team of you know, our best engineers at, at Salesforce and it was very easy. We were lit up by the passion um, from Liberty Asia and wanted to see that vision through. So we did design thinking workshops with uh, the social workers in the field to understand, well, what are their real needs? How do you harmonize that across some of them that are working on preventative, working on um, <clears throat> interventions, and working on, our, on support so that you have a better model? And this goes back to how can we, we he has the intention of using that data upstream mm -hmm. so that you can apply the AI models. You can gather intelligence so that someone who might be working on victim support can gather insights and data from the victims that can now help be a preventative measure when some of that data is collected and then brought upstream to things like uh, Thomson Reuters. And your, and your platform is, is literally leveraging technology you already have, correct? Yeah, I, I, so w this is the same platform that com and Thomson Reuters is a, is, a, is a customer, Adidas is a customer, Coca-Cola, Ford, a lot of the corporates that are managing customer information. You call them up on the phone, you have a problem with your car, that's a case management system. Right. We also deal with, so in this particular case, it manage, it's more like social services cases. But what we did is we d used our expertise in mapping their needs to business function, to customizing this. And now what we're seeing is the system is also flexible to be customized for different industries, like fishing industry and palm oil industry, without breaking that model so it can scale. And so I, you know, we're proud to see that the team has taken this uh, beyond their expectations, and now they have 30 uh, NGOs. And they're using digital to actually bring the world-class tools so now they can click on a, on a button and add geolocation to that test. So now we can get a hotspot map of where these locations are. Um, and then also digital training. So using video, using collaboration so that it makes it easier to standardize the training the way that uh, frontline social workers are entering this information so that it's valuable. So if there's some insights and standard ways of asking those questions, it can be put into the system. It can be built as part of a online learning module. Training and education. I'm gonna to come to my two nerd girlfriends here in just a second. <laughs> training, education, big data. This is a huge part of what DHS is doing, Carlos. Can you talk a little bit about the education that you're doing, not just in the US, but across the globe, and how big data comes into play with how you are, are looking at this problem? Absolutely. I'm the end user. All the information that uh, comes to us from other law enforcement agencies that work with us in the US we deployed with the use of, uh, for example, that this fantastic application that I, I learned about it. It was 13 months ago when I started working at the center and uh, I received a call from uh, Los Angeles saying, have you heard about this app? And uh, the results were fantastic. Going to what I do, I travel around the world mainly to five locations to train other law enforcement, uh, our law enforcement counterparts in, in the, uh, uh, the countries, the, the source countries, 
transit destination countries and how to fight human trafficking. When it comes to the data and the apps, I'll give you for example, here is the WeChat. I am sure that at least half of the people that are, are from Hong Kong have WeChat and uh, either have a line uh, in the U.S. is uh, WhatsApp, and I'm sure that probably most of the people also have WhatsApp too. So we need more cooperation from companies in order to learn the ways that they are bringing people into trafficking. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, legal or uh, obstructions in, in how to share all that data coming to us once it gets to us. Uh, and I did mention that I work also at the Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center. I think I did at the beginning. But uh, the, uh, once we receive the information, the, the process, and, and we have uh, staff of that hopefully soon will be uh, approximately 20 analysts would receive all the information and create a product, and this product, it's mainly for the United States, but the victims, a lot of the victims, a large, a large percentage of the victims are from other countries, from countries like Asia. Uh, China is probably the, the largest uh, victims when it comes to uh, sex and labor in the U.S. And for example, a, a trafficker lands at uh, JFK with uh, victims, several victims that may either end up working at a restaurant or work at a massage parlor. These people owe uh, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 just for the transportation. And after that, they will have to work for eight, 10 years to pay all that money back. So by using, by using WeChat, they already sending, they're, they're receiving payments uh, from where the girl or, or the person, the, the guy, it's going to be hired. We need to find ways to get that information faster, more efficient, uh, target the, uh, uh, the, because we work with uh, local law enforcement. We're not, uh, as a federal agency, we're not everywhere 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have to work with our, our local counterparts in each uh, city or state. So uh, I guess in summary, being at the, uh, at the uh, user end of the data, it is uh, uh, very challenging to uh, operate at a high speed. It, it is produced faster than we can work it. But uh, just remember, if uh, after, and this is the first time that I attend a, a, a summit in which they're not law enforcement or people that ha have a very little knowledge about human trafficking. Everyone here knows about human trafficking uh, from, from pictures, from uh, you all. The way that you uh, know the force, the uh, coercion of uh, traffic, closing the this this uh, spigot of of trafficking victims. I'm at the end of just investigating and rescuing the victims. It is so good to know that I now I have a broader knowledge of. Uh, how to talk to other countries and, and how to stop. A lot of issues, uh, borders, um, the, uh, the immigration system in each country, it's, it's just totally, totally different. But uh, we share the saying that we want to stop human trafficking. No. Thanks, Carlos. Get your questions ready, because we're going to make sure you have time to ask these very smart people things that you'd like to know. Emily, i got to ask you this. Um, how did you, as literally 
a very, very recent grad with a startup idea attract the attention of law enforcement with your product. That is no small feat to just, hey, I have this idea, I'm going to use facial recognition, I'm going to create a product called Traffic Jam, next thing I know. How did, how did that actually transpire? Yeah, so um, in the beginning it actually started pretty organically because I was still in research. I was just working on this, you know, the only person in the lab working on it. Um, and so in the beginning it started very organically because law enforcement had that pain point of so much data, but for them that was not a good thing. It translated into them spending hours scrolling and manually reading through these ads. And of course, you know, myself coming from the Robotics Institute, I was like, no, no, we don't want you doing that. That's terrible. We want you spending more time investigating and, and less time having to collate this data. And so they had that existing pain point. Um, it started to reach out to me. And really, uh, I would also say word of mouth recommendations are huge within law enforcement, having that trust um, and the recommendations and uh, the reputation. And so when we started working with the, the ones who initially called me up and started having success, you know, they'd throw leads my way and say, see what you can do with this. And uh, like I said, I quickly realized I cannot be, you know, fielding tips for all of US law enforcement. <laughs> and so that's why we, we created a software for them to be able to access it. Um, but then they started seeing the success. And uh, for law enforcement, what they really need is actionable information, uh, stuff that's really tangible, digested down to, okay, where can they go find someone? And so that's what we try to do. That's our challenge is to take this really advanced technology and distill it down into something that's actionable. Um, and then obviously the facial recognition, that's a little easier because when you say facial recognition, that's in the, in the movies, so everyone knows what that is. Whereas explaining machine learning, not everyone knows what that is. Right. Um, so that that's a little easier, uh, and, and people have been finding great success, as I mentioned before. Leanne, when, when we talked about Everledger, effectively what you're creating is a digital identity for things, a passport, if you will, from when that diamond comes out of the ground to the end supply chain. How big does this get? I mean, do you see it impacting food? Do you see it impacting the Internet of Things? Just, just how big is this in terms of what you've created and, and why use blockchain? Because I'm sure, you know, blockchain is one of those things that, um, depending on where you happen to sit, you're either in love with it on the hype, you're either crashed in disillusionment, or if you started early, you're coming out the other side now. That, that was like four questions in I one know. sentence. <laughs> but you're working on a you know, very interesting area. Um, you know, where does it go? I mean, it's yeah. the most important um, set of internet fabric that I think our generation needs to have and needs to see. So, um, you know, when we think about the internet, it's the fundamental economic instrument of our time. There's not a business in the world that doesn't rely upon it for trade and there's not an individual that doesn't access it on a daily basis. So for a zettabyte of data that's you know, constantly transacted across the internet, yet the identity of objects, some objects are smart. So we talk about autonomous cars and even to a certain extent some watches. We decided to focus on dumb but expensive stuff, things that literally... Um, are dumb. They're never going to be inherently connected to the internet. Um, we're often touted as a blockchain company, and I always have to excuse myself because we're not. We're an emerging technology company. Right. We're using the very best of machine vision and cognitive and blockchain and smart contracts to really wire a global trade network, an ethical trade platform. When you think about the trillions of dollars on a daily basis that are transacted across the globe when it comes to ethical trade, um, th this system is missing, and there's no reasons why we can't have this. There's no technical reason why. It's just a collective mind to be able to focus to focus on it. And I'd like to leave that as a, as a legacy. You know, it's something that I think is very important for transactional trade. We have WorldCheck, right? It knows and sees and understands people. And yes, there are some people that are missing identity, but there is an equivalent for objects. Right. And these are important objects, not only to every one of us in this room today, but for generations to come, whether we are passing down, you know, watches and pieces of art. But 
even beyond that for governments, what is happening with the looting of antiquities and cross-border transactions, all of these things are the vehicle for anti-money laundering. So if we're able to bring an identity with the combination of these new and emerging technologies to objects of value, then it's something that we have to do. It's no choice. Audience, looking for some questions to see if anybody's got uh, something they would like to ask this incredibly smart group. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, hi, my name is David Bishop. I'm a business ethics and law professor at Hong Kong U, but also a social entrepreneur, I guess. And um, because of those two hats, I find myself quite conflicted with this panel. Um, on the one hand, my, my social entrepreneur hat is tipped to you all. Um, I, I think what you're doing is really cool. Um, I love the fact, and you know, again, hats off to the Thompson Reuters team for really pointing to solutions in terms of not just talking about the problem, but how we can you know, move forward and, and really overcome these challenges. But kind of the business ethics scared of government guy says that every tool that you are promoting can be used to free people, but can also be used to enslave them or control them or you know, bind them, um, you know, facial technology or the idea, no offense, uh, my, my family's in government as well, but the idea of Homeland Security getting their hands on more information from cell phones, it terrifies me. Uh, like really terrifies me. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, whether it's blockchain, whether it's facial recognition technology, machine learning, how do you guys balance the ethics of this in terms of your uh, pushing the technology forward and using it for good things, but also with the very clear knowledge that these things can be used uh, to control people in a negative way, all the way back to, you know, George Orwell in 1984 and those ideas in, that he espoused, you know, 80, 90 years ago are, are very potentially real today. And I'm just curious how you balance those things. So here's what we're going to do, because this one could pretty much wrap up the next 13 minutes. Anybody that wants to speak, I'm watching the clock. You get 60 seconds. Fair enough? All right. All right. Go. Okay. <laughs> I'll start with facial recognition. So uh, great question, and those are important concerns. My answer to that is the data that we deal with is extremely, extremely focused. Uh, facial recognition exists beyond us and can be applied to a whole range of other data sets, but ours is specifically focused on human trafficking. Um, of course, we can't control what every single user does with it, um, but you know, we very carefully vet the users as well. Um, and, and we know that the people that are investigating human trafficking, um, they really have a heart for that issue. There's a reason that they chose to work on that issue. Um, and so, you know, we, we trust that they'll use it for good. 41 seconds, well played. Carlos. <laughs> Open sources. Mm -hmm. It's there. We, uh, what she did is just a funnel and bring everything together just fantastic and I understand your concern about privacy but fighting against it in, in the way that this is mainly sex trafficking what we're talking about about a, a young girl or a guy that it's been used in their picture again it's like a picture again open and it's out there Changing names, a little makeup here and there. Different. Sometimes we're looking at a, a, a section of the face you can't recognize. If we got this opportunity, we'll stop when we start going into other things than human trafficking. That's awesome. my promise. Thanks, Carlos. Leanne. Um, one of the largest considerations, and I'm going to go really nerd on you right now, so is a lot of governments and, and cryptographers around the world are, are looking at privacy preserving computational methods. So the encryption of data at rest and encryption of data at wire is one of the largest transformative technologies that we haven't even seen yet. Um, homomorphic encryption at the level of full and partial encryption is something that I think is the biggest bet that you'd want to put your, put your money on. So that will give the ability to be able to blind a service between financial institutions and governments around the world 
to seek out um, matching services around certain parts of data but still actually have privacy preserving, pre preserving mechanisms in place. And to Leanne's point, I'm going to just add 10 seconds. There is now a, the first commercial company in business launching a homomorphic encryption solution out of Washington, D.C. and Vail. We, Rob. We, yeah, we, we've had it for about 18 months, but we haven't been able to publicly announce it. Yeah, Manil, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rob. I, I, I would say some of the things that um, we know that are, are a challenge are th um, the, the NGOs still need to be compliant, mm -hmm. right? There are still PDPA issues. There are still uh, security issues. And so they have to be aware of that, certainly. If someone is a frontline social worker, they, they don't want their name published or sent out. They want some of those details kept private. So I think that part of it. The second part is some of these are really about opening up, essentially being more transparent. Um, there are organizations that are publishing these, and, and the publishers on the back page, they're making billions of dollars. So that's, that's like walking down the street. That's public and that's open. What the tools do is it makes that more transparent. Now we understand what's going on below. And the same thing with uh, the supply chain. To understand where your fish is coming from, maybe blockchain will be able to do that. Give the digital identity for the fish and not only, well, who, who were the fishermen that actually were paid and were they actually, how much were they paid for that? So I think that, that compliance can be built into it as well as keeping the protections of some of, those private, some of that private data. Yeah. So my um, answer is kind of, it's a bit random, but bear with me. Um, and it's one of, what your point is something that we've been considering. So from our perspective, we're looking at how can technology enhance the agency of migrant workers? And, and if you look, think of technology, the bad guys are using the technology already. And so why can't we use the technology too? Um, so we talk about, there's a guy called Toyama who talks about technology being an amplifier. I wrote it down here because I thought it might be interesting. But technology is an amplifier rather than acting as an additive or a transformative thing. So it's not going to change people's behavior. But we can ha enhance and use this technology to enhance the output. For example, the, um, the facial recognition and all this kind of stuff. We're using it as a tool for us and it's going to enhance what's already there. In the same way, traffickers and people like that are probably using tools to enhance their own behavior, which is what we want to stop. Absolutely right. Another question from the audience. Hi, Karen Wu from uh, Deutsche Bank. So as a financial institution, we, we get a lot of like uh, offers from vendors on offering us technologies and so on. So I just want to see, like get some views on what do you think will be the, sort of the best investment for financial institutions in tackling um, anti-slavery or other sort of money laundering um, activities. Okay, you each get to pick one. You do not get to embellish because we're going to do questions. Which one? One of these guys won. Oh, okay. <laughs> Rob, uh, how about Rob, I'll start with you then. Well, I, uh, from our standpoint, we, we are offering this our technology to NGOs. So we're essentially uh, giving this in for, uh, we're giving away our, our product to uh, amplify how NGOs are serving their mission. So. Um, you know, we, we, as far as we, we also sell commercial software to the, to the vendors, but I would look at um, making sure that you're getting, uh, the, the NGOs are using the best in breed in technology. So they should be, they should be using world-class technology that the regular rest of the industry is using. Platform. Yep. Emily? Um, I think that we'll have the most, and what I've seen is that we'll have the most scalable success uh, when we partner together. And so I already talked about, uh, you know, cross-referencing data sets to identify transactions linked to trafficking. Um, again, that's what I would echo. Um, we can have the most impact when we're not siloed, when we can better identify those things that are already out there. We know they're out there, we just have to find them. Um, and so I think uh, the ability to cross-reference data sets, bring uh, the silos together is, is going to be extremely important. I don't think you can complete a picture with just one piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So I think it doesn't come down to the technology, it comes down to interoperability. How are we able to form the standards around data and interoperable uh, mechanisms so that we can begin to share not only um, you know, regulated um, uh, procedures but, but, but also from a data, data perspective. We are in the most exciting transformative time um, on the planet, and that is we are converging 
um, exponential technologies which are coming together. Um, and we have a maturity about our, our, our world now. We're in you know, maybe the fourth generation of the internet. And so we will start to see uh, a lot more of these technologies coming together and forming um, you know, a, a, a symbiotic sort of approach to the world. I also think blockchain will become quite disappointing. It will become like the air we breathe. It will become digitally ubiquitous. And just as we speak about it today, in two, three years' time, we won't even realise and understand that it's become the fabric of, of use when it comes to sort of integrated services. More questions? If not, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Oh boy, here we go again. He's going <laughs> to he's going to hammer us on ethics again here. No, no, go on. We, we could. That's no, all right. Not enough time. Uh, no. Uh, separate question, um, although similarly related. So most of what you're discussing, again, really cool technology, very interesting, but primarily on the back end of these things, right? So finding someone after they've been lost, uh, tracking something after it's been shipped. I'm curious from your perspective of how we can better utilize technology to stop these things from occurring in the first place. And the most obvious example of that would be the underlying cause of all these things, especially in terms of the, the trafficking or transfer of persons, whether they're a migrant worker going elsewhere or whatever, is essentially the fact that we are not utilizing the technology that we have to provide more economic and socioeconomic e equality um, in developing countries around the world, right? I mean, Asia is a hotbed for these things simply because there's so much disparity in wealth. And so I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your perspective in terms of how we can better utilize technology. Again, thinking of all the different people we have here in this room who represent one side of that wealth equation for the most part, how we can do a better job of taking the technology that we have, whether it's AI, machine learning, and these other things, and making sure that we're putting that technology to use to level the playing field so that this doesn't become an issue in the first place and then we don't have to track people or find them or, or you know, other things. So I'd like, I'd like Carlos and, and Hannah to answer this because these are the technology providers here. You're, you guys are end users and you're, you're in the front line. So what do you think, Carlos? Outreach. We have the blue campaign in the United States and uh, there are different versions from the UN. Uh, blue Heart, I, most of them start with the word blue. Can't remember the other ones. We have to use technology to reach out the vulnerable populations so they understand that if it's too good to be true, it is not. So outreach, uh, language barriers. We, uh, go going back to the blue campaign in the United States, we are able to uh, reach out to most of the populations and we learn from the victims. Uh, we are constantly thinking of ways to reach. I have been in, in meetings that we're looking at uh, uh, potential sex workers. And uh, how do we get the message to them? Do we uh, make a little shoebox card? Do we put them in, in, in gum? Do we send a text alert to uh, a massive numbers and, and just say, this is what's human trafficking. It's not human smuggling. This is, uh, if, you see, uh, if you see a person that is uh, working and you always see her or him working and uh, you don't see breaks, you don't see all those, it's communication, uh, educating the public and the potential victims. Anna, you and I talked about the language thing. That was, a, yeah. it's an amazing statistic and you got to hear what what you're dealing with. Um, so I don't know exactly what statistic you're talking about, but <laughs> it probably was really good. It was a big number. <laughs> it was a big number you mentioned. It was a very big number of languages, remember? Uh, oh, from Myanmar. Yes. Okay, so there are hundreds of um, different languages spoken in Myanmar, for example. That was one of the things. But maybe to answer your question you asked, I don't know if technology actually is the solution to some of these things. It's about education. So um, before coming to UNU, I've been working at Rhodes University in South Africa, looking at increasing citizen participation in local government. And it was all about education. So we had radio um, programs in different languages. We had a drama um, that looks at how to monitor government um, 
service delivery and um, how, what, what is transparency and what is accountability and what are your rights as citizens and how can you participate meaningfully instead of burning things. It's, it's that kind of stuff. It's not always going to be an app or, or anything like that because people don't always go to apps for all kinds of information. We even did things like um, we did stuff with the taxi drivers and hairdressers to say these are people. People sit in a taxi for a long time and people in South Africa, they get their hair done for a very long time. Um, and so these were uh, maybe some evangelists and they would share the information about how to participate meaningfully in local government. So it's different avenues other than just apps and computers that we have to look at. Leanne, I'm going to give you the last word. Oh, great. <laughs> you know, from a diamond perspective, we have to trace it from the source of the mine, I think, at, at its inception, when that diamond is first uh, birthed from the ground. Um, but one mantra that we know that is now starting to become gospel within the industry because we have a collective mind is, if it cannot be traced, it cannot be traded. So it's as simple as that. I want to ha thank this panel so much. I mean, the preparation, the time they gave me to help understand what they've all been working on has just been phenomenal. And I hope what you've taken away is that tech can solve a lot of the problems. Tech is creating a lot of problems. But tech can also solve a lot of the challenges that we have with both trafficking and the provenance of product. Thank you, Hannah, Rob, Emily, Leanne, Carlos. Hopefully, you all are sticking around later. Yes? We nod our heads? Yep. So if you've got additional questions that you want to ask any of the panel, please do so at the drinks. Join me in thanking them for their time today. Thank you.